as much. Yeah. All right, so let's start. So today we're doing phylogenetics again. Um, one thing to highlight: so we had two people took the quiz, and so you know, using phylogenies, well, like why you want them, you folks get. Um, just two comparisons who are weaker on. And some of you nailed it, some of you didn't. So, what is a statistical comparison? Okay, so this is what we're talking about. Yeah, so not either of those. Cl close, you're, you're around the answer, right? But it's, it's close, but yeah, so here we have a tree. Okay. Um, all right, so for the tree, so it's just progressions I can do. I can do this with this. That's one of them. And they're two of the closest relatives, right? But I can also do this. With this, right? And this could be, you know, back in Cambrian. It's going to be very close, right? But the most recent point is sort of, you know, this and this and this compare. So I have my node, and I compare the lineage descendant from each 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 so, so each descendant of the node, right? So this node and each pair. You this node and each pair. This node and each pair. Doesn't matter how deep it is. Okay. I can't do this node and this one and this one. I right? could not plates. So I could compare plates for this. Okay. But I could compare if I had that. I could compare this versus everything else. That's that's legit. Okay. So that's what sister groups are. Why do we bother? What? When traits evolve? Actually, we have more direct ways of doing that. Right? So you can just do it, which, which you don't know yet. That's OK. We're learning it today. That's cool. But yeah, we can actually reconstruct, you know, if this is all 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. We can reconstruct this as this is 0, 1, this is 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. And then just a little bit directly without having to worry about what the sisters are. What else? What else? What else? I mean, see how the two groups <coughs> differ from the common um, ancestor? Nope, not quite that either. So, um, why do we care about just, just those two different from the common ancestor? Right? It's, I mean, that would be like this comparison with this comparison, but also you have like this and this. And Right, they're comparable. So we can say, um, if I'm comparing you know, this one versus this one, up to this point, they're identical. And after that point, they diverge. <coughs> and they serve sort of as controls for each other. Right? Same way we do identical twin studies, right? The same genetic material, when they pop out of the womb, they're now independent, right? We're controlling for all the similarities through the same genetic structure. Right? Um, and I can do many twin studies, and I always, if I always find the twin that smokes lives less, li, li, you know, lives shorter on average, that's just as smoking, right? Or just comparing smokers versus non-smokers, maybe smokers are a different income level, maybe smokers tend to be older than young, young non-smokers, right? But by doing twins, I control for it directly. The same thing with sister compression, we're doing this control, this careful control of them. Right. So I use those. Is that clear now? Other questions about it? So, and other and other traits, right? Now, it only gives you a system comparison only gives you one comparison, right? So I have if I, same thing with a twin state with just one twin, well, one, one pair of twins, right? So you know, Bob smokes and died younger than than Bill, right? But Bob also liked to go skydiving, right? And died in a skydiving accident. Um, <coughs> but if I do many many comparisons, then I can see the same thing with here. So this, you know, this can be one comparison. I might say, okay, the twin that had this trait is more diverse. 
we have to test it again and again and again to see if it's significant. Uh, each of those tests is independent. Does that make sense? Other questions? And the nice thing about these is you can do them without having to worry about branch lengths. So talk, we talked about how you know trees have branch lengths can represent the amount of change or time, right? But those are things that are subject to estimates. So there's some imprecision there, right? Um, here, there's no matter. All we care about is the topology, the tree shape, not the tree branch lengths. It's a little more robust right it's also not super powerful, right? So, we're going to look at so, for example, the study done by Elizabeth Weiser looking at beetles and herbivory, and the herbivory leads to more more species, right? And there's only five cases on the beetle tree. There was a clear shift from you know, where such groups like one one's herbivorous, one is not herbivorous, you know, carnivorous or even get to try to things like that. And so, those five comparisons all ended up being in the plus direction for herbivory causing more diversification, right? So the p-value was like 0.045 or something. That's significant, right? That's just, you know, out of all of, you know, 300,000 beetle species, these five comparisons. Okay. It's not all the power there. That's the advantages. OK. So today we're doing some, I like this section. This is a fun section. So we're going to learn about different methods and the connections between them. So we understand at the end of this some of the connections between methods and some of the basic elements of methods in phylogenetics. Okay. Um, <coughs> and so and there's a huge range of phylogenetic methods. And so I could lump them by you know what question they address, right? Correlations, biogeography, things like that. Or I could lump them by you know, what the method, you know, what the method is. What I'm just going to do here is talk about, you know, this basic similarities. Basically, in phylogenetics, we have basically three models we use. Okay? We use them again and again and again. So we use the same models for biogeography as we use for DNA evolution, so even though they're very different. So what we learn about today is what these connections are and how they work together. Okay? Because you do grid, and you know, when I teach it this way, I find that students then start proposing new methods. We say, oh, well, we can just modify the DNA methods and do this for you know, my ecology, ecological question. I think it gets a sense of the, what the deep connections are. Okay. <coughs> and so analogy is baking, right? So how do you make this stuff? Well, you use flour, sugar, egg, butter, some sort of leavening, some sort of liquid, right? And then you can sort of tweak things, add some cocoa powder, get some brownies, um, <coughs> do different baking styles, you get pancakes and waffles, right? It's always like the same stuff, just presented in different ways. Okay, so we're going to learn about the basic elements of like how you build a method, like what's the flour, what's the egg, what's the sugar, okay. and then we'll get, and then we'll figure out how to use them better. Okay. <coughs> so one set of methods we can call continuous time Markov chain and finite state space. Just clear, right? Move on. Um, <coughs> okay. So discrete time, something like this, right? Each second, with, 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 right? But continuous time, you know, indivisible time. If you have half second, have a quarter second, have a billionth of a second. Okay. <coughs> How does life evolve? Continuous. Why? Other people, what do you think? Something is we have some like overlapping generations, like humans, that could be sort of continuous. Right? That's something that has like you know butterflies that have annual populations. Maybe it's discrete. Okay. <coughs> but over millions of years, uh, even if we're completely discrete, and eh, you know considering continuous isn't part of that bad approximation. So for all these methods, we have to treat them as so time is this thing that is made. Okay, so the continuous time part of it means. Okay. Uh, Markov chain. Right? A 
collection of random variables where the future is dependent only on the current state. Right? So this game, Chutes and Ladders. Right? <coughs> How do, I think it depends like snakes and something else. But, you know, it's a basic board game. Right? You move around, and if you land on a slide, you go down, if you land on a ladder, you go up. Right? And if I'm right here, what happens next? It's not going to matter depend on whether I slid down here or climbed up there. Right? My next move is based on when it's giving a little spinner, whether I move one step or two steps or three steps. Okay. <coughs> Chess is similar to that. Um, right? So I can create this board. So what, you know, it's white thing we're going to do next. Right? It doesn't really matter what happens in the past this position. Subject to some things about the castle and things like that. In general, right, um, it doesn't matter what happens in the past, you just look where you are now and choose the next move. Right? It's a Markov process. Non-Markovian has a memory. Hello. So here's my neighbor's house. Right? <coughs> and you can see, you know, what the money is sold for and then how the price changed. And, you know. and when, when they want to sell the house again, they want to shoot, sell it based on not losing money. Right? And so they're going to use the, you know, the previous sale, month, sale amount to the baseline. If they're really having trouble selling it a little lower a little bit. That's sort of what it sold like it sold for in the past, is what, what they're trying to sell it for in, in the present. Right, so it's not Markovian. It has a history, history matters. Okay. <coughs> and so if I have, you know, three possibilities, zero, one, and two, right? If I'm at zero, you know, whether I move, you know, well, if I say I'm at, yeah, at zero, it doesn't matter whether I got there from two or from one. I'm probably going to one to get on the same rate. Okay? So it's Markovian. Right? And most of our models are Markovian in biology. Finite state space. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. yep. Finite and often discrete state space, too. Right? So examples could be A, T, G, and C. Right? At a single you know, base pair, I don't have half A, half T. It's either A, T, G, or C. Right? What are your herbaceous? Susceptible and effectively covered, like an SIR disease <coughs> model. Right? Herbivorous, omnivorous, carnivorous. You know, zero to 100 legs. Now, of course, biology is fuzzy, right? And so if I say, you know, herbivorous, nervous, carnivorous, you know, a male hippo will eat a, a carcass of, of, some, of a dead, you know, antelope, right, to get nutrition from it. So is it herbivorous or carnivorous? Well, you know, it's almost always herbivorous, but occasionally, you know, it's some meat, right? What are your herbaceous? Right? So what do I have a plant that has a stem this high, right, it has some lignin in it? Is it woody or not? Right? So this, it often be hard to figure out how to divide this continual biological mess into discrete states. Okay, but for this class of models, we always try to do that. We try to do say, okay, yeah, I know there's some variation here, but let's make this you know, woody or herbaceous. Let's make this. We either try to do herbivorous or carnivorous, maybe herbivorous or omnivorous or carnivorous. Right, and there's probably some of the in between. But there's some of the Okay, so. When you're looking at studies that do this sort of thing, one question you can ask is, how do they do this with bias their results? Okay. <coughs> so we just study published looking at evolution of plants um, in the temperate and tropical regions. Right? And what defines something as being temperate or tropical? Right? It's really based on you know, where, where they occur, does it freeze more than three days a year or something like that. Right? And that's sort of arbitrary. It could be two days a year. It could be... You know, do you care about the entire population as a whole, or do you care about you know every or just the majority of the population? Right, so we're where like one individual is in an area that seems like it freezes, only in a sort of warm part of nook, and it doesn't matter. Maybe you do want to count that. And depending on how you call that, you get different results for the rates. Okay, so this discrete sizing of data can be a controversial thing to do. Okay, but it allows us to use these powerful models.
All right, so let's work through one of these models. All right, so let's take Twinkies as an, as an example. Okay. Um, and why we like Twinkies? Well, they can last forever. Right, so we're going to worry about the like, decay process for these. You have a Twinkie, you don't have a Twinkie, that state persists for all time. Okay. <coughs> um, so, imagine I have a store, I'm tracking what happens to my Twinkies in my store. Right. And I can say, with probably 22, uh, no, on that day, that Twinkie we bought by an adult. Okay. Wave point one, we bought by a child. Wave point oh five, it will be stolen. Okay. So that's again the per day probabilities. All right. So what's the probability? What's the probability of it leaving the store that day? Point three five. Is there anything else? No multiplier. Okay, so multiplier at. What? Adam, anyone want to say multiply? Right, yeah. So we add them. Press the point three five is the answer. Okay? Good. If it leaves, it's probably it was paid for. Agree with that? Yep. Right. Okay. This is probably it stays in the store for at least, for at least two days. Is that so? Talk. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Everyone agree? Good. All right. Right. So you can figure out from this very simple model, right, what the chance of it being stolen is, what the chance of it staying in the store for many for many time steps is, right, from just these three numbers. Okay. Well, we can do the same sort of model in general for DNA or for woody herbaceous. Okay. Um, give it one sec. Yep. So probably it, it Yeah, so right. Probably stay in store more than two days. Probably stay in store one day is one minus always the week store. And then probably it happens two, two days in a row. That's good. good. Okay. Good thing. Thanks for stopping me. Other questions? All right. Now let's make it a little more complex. So let's get rid of the day and just make it some arbitrary time period. And now I have the same thing, but now I have some scaling. Right? So if we're doing half a day, right, it might be divided by two. Right? An hour might divided by 24. Okay, we have some sort of time scaling there. Okay? So number of events per time. Now we're looking at it, it's calling it as a rate. Right? So the rate at which adults take it versus a child take it versus it's stolen. Okay, we still good? Make sense? Okay. okay. <coughs> well, Twinkies don't only exist in stores. Right? They can go to other places too. So let's make a more complex matrix of where they can go. Right. So now I can go, you know, from the store to an adult, or I can go from the adult to a child. Right. If you ask me to your neighborhood, you want to die, die young, you give it Twinkies. Child to adult, right? Thief to child, right? Um, <coughs> so all these different rates, and so we can fill these in as well. Right? And then here, just you know, probably you know, stay so one minus these, right? So one minus this one.
All right, and so we can use this matrix to get questions. These are questions, right? So let's say the store ever get Twinkies back. Right? Is there ever returns on Twinkies? So how could so imagine I could, think, I could say okay, we try to get here. Well, how could I look at the problem and figure out if um, people do return Twinkies? What what numbers in the matrix would tell me that? So then we're going into the store, right? So this column right here. Right? And so, right, so if I have a rate matrix, my question could be, are these rates zero or non-zero? Okay. If I have a way of estimating those rates, I can then make a test. It's okay. My hypothesis is that people never give cookies back to the store. Okay. So we now test the likelihood of you know, these being zero versus these being allowed to be greater than zero. Now I'm testing that, right? <coughs> so, yeah. plus one, rate of going from anywhere to the store, zero, plus is two, rate of going anywhere to the store is greater than zero. Okay? What do you think the answer will be here? You accept the null? Would you reject the null? Okay. Now, question Is it going to be exactly zero? No. So, why are you testing it? You know the answer. Ooh, that is it. Right? So, well, so, what's the purpose? Like, so, the more general thing about how, how, doing stats, right, in evolutionary ecology, right? Here, the null. I know it's not going to be true. Right? I know that somewhere on this planet, someone has brought a Twinkie into a store and they left it on the shelf and walked out. Right? <coughs> so I know that this rate isn't exactly zero. It can't be exactly zero. So why are you testing it? What are you, what are you figuring out by test by rejecting or not rejecting it? Well, we're figuring out how it compares to Okay. 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 Other people, what do you think? But I mean, this hypothesis is like, is it absolutely zero or is it slightly higher than zero? So I can make, you know, if this number were one out of a billion, right, I could reject this null. We have enough power. So why is that interesting? That's a function of your data set size, right? Okay. But everyone uses alpha point oh five, right? This is your human you're dealing with. <laughs> Dear science, <laughs> I have proven that. Yeah. Um, you're going to say we're going to say something. Relaxed. Oh, okay. <laughs> Better be absorbing. Um, <laughs> what a little thing about this. Okay, what do you mean? Um, so, how you can see how I, so if you're going to use these as predictions, you can see how far off your prediction actually does get. Um, so, you can make differences between the thing that's in the game. You're choosing a, a good model, right? Okay. Um, but then in this case, I mean, that mo which model is best depends on your data set size, right? Right, so what, what's, what, what's the p-value mean? Right. Right. Yeah, 
So, you know, one out of 20 chance that this would just happen by luck. Right. And so what I'm trying to get, in, get you to think about is, you know, so we always played, trained in this classic hypothesis testing of, you know, rejecting you know, low p values, right? But the you know, statisticians don't like that much anymore. And so, I mean, we still do it, it's good to do. The Lamarna approach is to look at, you know, what are the rate estimates? Right. So figure out, you know, I can estimate what the rate we can, well, going back to the store is, and get a confidence interval on those rates, or a credible interval on those rates. And then I say something about the biological meaning of it. Because, right. um, <coughs> you know, rejecting a trivial null isn't that interesting. Right. So in my work, we look at rates of evolution on a tree. Are the rates equal, equal across all of life? No, we know that going in. Right. So what's the point of doing this? We can just say, okay, are the rates faster in this clade? I think it'll be faster for some other reason. Okay, and like, oh wow, they're threefold faster. That's that's meaningful. Okay, so you do the bio, do the, the numerical significance, probabilistic significance, but also think about what the actual question is you're asking. Right, maybe there's a better measure for that than just than just doing the p value. Okay, like looking at the rate estimates or looking at all average rate estimates. And you'll see this come up as we talk more about methods later, later in the semester. You know, what, what methods give you and what you can use them for. Okay. <coughs> what if I want to test this? Do adults give to kids the same way kids give to adults? Well, there, you know, here's my null. The rates of the logarithm that compare are these two. Right? So I can constrain and say, you know, what's the likelihood of giving these equal? It's really giving these things that aren't equal. What are the other pronouns? What are those to be? What's the idea? Yep. So, so one thing I could do is I could fix them at the free primitive version. Yep. What else? No. Next. <laughs> because because if you had any you know store to thief movements, then you get elected to blow up. You know, before, before you blow up. Yeah. Avoid NAs in life. What else can you do? Only if you can set them all to be equal. Right? Okay. All I want to do is worry about these terms and make them all equal. Or I could let them all be free. Right? Either way, I can still try to train these to be the same or different. Right? Because I'm letting them all be free, depending on what parameters in the model, and of course, not to be equal. Okay. And we'll talk about, we talk about some more, more of the methods. You know, people have a choice of how they constrain the model. If you don't have a lot of data, maybe you have to make it so that there's fewer parameters to estimate. Or if you don't hurt you from realism. Okay, and that's where we get into this with the AIC or other model selection approaches. We say, okay, given I want to test this hypothesis, let's try you know, different kind of models and other parameters, see which one loses the least amount of information. Use that, use those. Okay. <coughs> Good. Any questions about that? Okay. So, in real life, how this model been used? So, <coughs> One sort of cool, simple example is looking at human societal evolution. Okay. And we can imagine, so it's looking at humans dispersing across the uh, ocean. Okay. And in you know, certain places we have you know, major states, like Java, some places we have you know, acephalous groups, no leader, some places we have you know, complex cities, cheap tips. Okay. And so as people you know, travel from island to island, you know, colonize them, some of the language changes a little bit, so you can actually construct a family tree based on just language alone. Okay. Um, you can also look at how these different societal structures evolve in that tree. Okay. What, what might be hypotheses here that you want to check? Okay. 
Okay. Yes, yeah, many people who are, you know, in the polling area all have one style leadership. People in the open areas. Um, have a different kind of style, right? Now it shows some sort of files in a clumping, right? Where people relate to each other have similar style structures. What's my what you'd be curious about? I change over time, right? So if I go from this up the tree, I always see well, what sort of changes are you curious about? Mm -hmm. Like there's some bias towards being more complicated, or less complicated, or what? Good. What else? Okay. I right, so think about what the branch lengths here mean. It would probably mean, it doesn't mean here, I think, the time. Right, but you might be doing branch length in terms of the amount of word changes. Does that correlate with the amount of style change? Right, if you have a huge style change, your words change a lot too. And so, what they did in this study, let's look at your question of, you know, is this in order? Do we have, you know, going from acephalus to simple chiefdom to complex chiefdom to state? Or do we have, you know, I know you can go to anyone else and go from you no know, chiefs to having a public tick system and back. Um, we can go one step each way, but then always collapse back one. Right. <coughs> so there's a lot of complex models here. Right? How can we test them? Slides. I can see you. <laughs> All right. I can take the Twinkie example and extend it, right? So here I had four states, right? And I had a lot of conditions between each of the states. Okay. I can just relabel it. Instead of stores and child, I have you know, acephalus, simple chiefdom, common chiefdom, and state. And now I have rates for each of these, right? And so if I want to fit this model, how do I mess with this to make it fit that model? What do I do? Okay, so this and this zero. Here. Right. So it could be zero. If we could actually have you know a zero right here, right? But we want the law to be free, so it could be non-zero rate. So I'm going from here with A A to S C, that's where A to S C that's this rate right here. And so we allow them all to fit that. Okay. What about this one? S C to A. Zero. There's no way it can go from here back. And so it's no way of saying the rate from here to here is zero. And so I can force that here. What about here? Zero. Right. What about here? Exactly. <coughs> so I can create, force all these to be zero. This complex model just continues. Right? And so I can then use this as my model to have rates, you know, look at the likelihood of the data given this rate. Okay? I can do the same thing for any model here. Take this model. Right? We just hop to neighbor nodes. And now it's a matter of just fixing some things in here. So I can go from A to CC? No. Go from SC to CC. Yes. It's allowed to be free. And of course, the full model 
is you know, everything's allowed to vary. Right? Now you could still find the full, full model that like this right here, the F best estimate for that might be zero. Right? I'm not forcing it to be, that's why I'm all choose what that rate is. Okay. So now this, you know, <coughs> very complex set of potential models, you can see we can just re restrict it to these various matrices. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, I haven't shown you how you actually use that rate matrix and get a light out of it. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Right, right now, you know, it's the basic part of that model, just that rate matrix. Right? And I can try different rate matrices and see which one generates the best likelihood. Or the minimum AIC. Or the highest base factor. Okay? So I can do that for all these. Make, make sense? And so, that's what they did. This is a paper in Nature, by the way. So now you can see, like, oh, it's a basic model, right? Nature paper. Um, <coughs> and they found they averaged the averaged models. And what they did was, for each model we talked about, each of those matrices, they got the left side. And they, or actually, they did a Bayesian approach. They figured it in a good way. And if one model is twice as good as the other model, right? We can do a weighted average of the rates. So if one model <coughs> says rate zero, and then also the rate is 0.1, right? one model is twice as good, we might do you know two times zero plus one times 0.2 over three. It's a weighted, weighted average. Okay, so they do that and get this sort of set of rates. Does this make sense? This set of rates. Then what you get, get, get the results is like crazy values. Right? And so it's worth thinking about like, oh, is my data wrong? Is my tree wrong? What's happening? Um, in this case, does this make sense? <coughs> what's, what's the story here? Yep. Yeah, so the biggest rates in the tree are these. So the different trees are right, right, right. So we can hop back and what else? Right, so you very rarely pop all the way over the state from these smaller organizations. What else? Right. Um, does that make sense? Why would my make that be? <laughs> right. It's like a good disease of walking out or a failed origin or something. Yeah. Right. Now that I'm getting people hopping different islands, right? So it could be that you go from you know, people in a large island of the state to a small island and support a thousand people. Right? And so in that case, that could create a state function that would make them smaller. Okay? So it sort of makes sense. Right? And so we can think about this in the rate matrix as, <coughs> you, know, you, know, you know, how these put in here, right, have a large rate of going from simple chief to the complex chief. Right? Um, a medium rate going from you know, alpha down one step otherwise, and then small rates going here to here. Still greater than zero. Okay. So that's using this simple rate matrix, looking at a single trait with multiple states of all. Okay. Well, what about something like this? So here's a study we did on primates, right? And looking at um, primates and how, how they play. Right? So they all play individually, but do they play socially or do they have, and also do they have sex with them? Right? You might think there's a correlation there, right? Where things might, um, if they're playful in general, right? Um, like playful in general, or if it's not playful in general, right? You can say, okay, if I move from here to here, how do I do that? Which play starts first? You know, you might say, okay, maybe you think social play is right, right? Um, because you know you're you're with others, other you know other children or not children, 
what your impairment's called? Yeah. Which aren't for young primates. Um, <laughs> you're, you're with other young primates who play, you know, they can see play evolving in that way. You can actually go this way fast. Okay? Um, we can test that, but we can test that directly. All right? And the way we do this is, even though there's two different traits, right, two binary traits rather than one four-state trait, it's still this basic matrix. Right, it's still this basic matrix. Okay. Where now my state is actually this combination going to this combination. And this combination and this combination. Okay. Use some ways in which this doesn't, co doesn't correspond. So this match here in some way. Right. So I can't go from here to here directly. Right? But here, it's just like can. Right? Letting, right? So stop zeros in there. Right? <coughs> um, and so once we put these zeros in, now we've created a model for looking at correlated evolution of two characters. Okay? The paper that did this came out in 94, we've been said like 700 times. Um, and you just figure out how you do it in your class. As you see how they're all connected, right? You want to imagine that you know, a model for you know, two binary characters co-evolving is the same as the model for one character with four states with no co-evolution, <coughs> right? But they're the same basic model underneath, so in the hood. That's what a connection trying to get you to understand. So you can imagine other ways to connect these models. Okay. Are you limited to two binary states? How can you, how can you expand it? I had more rows and columns, right. And so Jeremy Ballew, who's a postdoc here at Nimbus, has a program where we send it to three binary traits, Ooh. right? Which no one's done before, right? We have a paper getting out to review again, but we have six binary traits working together. Okay. Why don't you just make this, make this matrix bigger, okay? But until those papers, you know, all of biology is limited to just two binary traits, and no one other coded to more than a four by four matrix. Right, so most of us is 4 by 4 for this situation. Right, where now that you see how to do it, you could take a general program that does these sort of transitions and just slap on more rows and columns. Okay, see how they're very connected. Okay. Now, matrices can get scary and hard to convert, and there can be numerical issues. Right? But the basic math, you know, just like, rows and columns, new right? labels, you're done. Right? It's kind of remarkable it's that simple. There are, there are millions of species. Uh, well, right. That's what. And so, one of the things. So the person, the paper I was mentioning, that ninety-four paper that has lots of citations. One thing that he did uh, with Mark Fagel was develop his naming the models. Really, get all things to be equal. It's called that one model. All things to be independent. It's called a different model. I can set it so that um, this equals this and this equals that, and call it another model. So he had like eight models that had names. And then you're looking at a smaller set of model, models. But the general case, and you can imagine there's many, many models here. All right, and what we found with primates was this sort of set of eight parameters. Right, so, what does this suggest? Even though these are sort of connected, it might be actually faster if we could go this to this to this. Okay. Now it could be, of course, that you know, the official state is here, but it doesn't tell us the direction of evolution. The official state is here. It tells us that you know, once you're here, how can you move? And here's that Pagel approach I was ta talking about, right? Where we have the omnibus test to compare like, one model to a different model, and we have the hinted trade chain, freedom, and the temporal order test. That's right? all it is. Different ways of restricting this ma these matrices and seeing if the likelihood is better or worse. 
Milky ratio tests. So I mean, it's definitely something you know how to do, right? And yet, this has been tremendously influential. Okay. So, yeah. there's my paper. This is, and then, you know, how it's been used. I'm looking at you know, social reality in primates. Um, climate and specialization in after AC. Right? Life cycle evolution. I mean, frog evolution, all over the place. Okay, this has a small community. And actually, there's a recent paper criticizing some of the use of this model because it will actually look at switching comparisons. And we'll talk about that maybe later in the class. But you can use this model and get in trouble using this model if you have very few, few changes in the tree. Okay. That's something we just discovered you know, this year. Okay. So tell the groups in this model. Okay. Okay. <coughs> and so we have these models. You know, you can imagine instead of having you know sex play and, and social play, having C. That's what's interesting, right? But what do I want data for this? Right? For binary traits, for or conditions, for covariant model, we have the evolution turning on and off. Right? Um, <coughs> and so all these models are the same ones. It's, it's the same continuous time Markov chain uh, Markov chain with finite state space models. Right? So all these different labeling. If you know one, you'll know them all. Alright, so how does you get the likelihood for this? <coughs> so we take this instantaneous rate matrix, which is only called Q. Right? It's rate going from here to here, these rates that we've been talking about. And we often don't bother showing the labels. And then we can take these instantaneous rates times time. Right. And we can exponentiate it. Okay. And then from that, we can get this condition matrix. Right. Where I have, given this amount of time in the rate matrix, with the probability of observing a change from A to B. There's probably a change over that time. Maybe the transition matrix. Right, so what? So yeah, you can do a little, and this math isn't hard, right? You have to be numbers times two. Let's do that. Why is this a good thing? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. So if I, so I could say, all right, now we see, you know, we know the rate of going from um, woody to herbaceous is, you know, 0.5, you know, per time unit, right? And so a million years from now, of all the woody plants, how many of them are going to be herbaceous at that point? All right. So we can, we can calculate the matrix and calculate. Okay, we herbaceous, that's this number. So we expect that 15% of them are going to be herbaceous in a, in a million years. Okay. Um, <coughs> but also we can go back in time and do it in the past. Right. And so if I have, here's a phylogeny. Right. And then for this purpose, I just have um, binary state, only zeros and ones. Okay. And so I can take, you know, this gets a Um, <coughs> and for this example, to make it simpler, um, we're going to make it such that I, what are the names? Like zero here and zero here. <coughs> and then zero here. Is that realistic? Give me, the, give me a ta uh, character like that. Uh, 
Well, also, it was realistic. We have an example of it. What? Tails. Tail? What about, what about the tails? Okay. Yeah, so they can't re-evolve tail, maybe. Okay, so actually a lot of traits are like that would be called dolo traits, where they think they, they, they might be able to evolve once, right, and they're easy to lose. And so you can imagine things like eyes, right? So eyes might have evolved once, but then lots of things like cave fish and have lost eyes. And so complex traits like that, you can you know, think, you know, we have one initial change and then all these losses. And so for stuff after that initial change, this would model this bit, right? Where I can go from the mutation spin off to that, I can think about, you know, um, <coughs> this zero thing having an eye, I can open, and then just play back. And so you can go from having an eye to having an eye closed, no eye. Right, so that can make a problem for estimating rates. If all I had was you know, one example, then what's the rate? I mean, do they have a, you know, very little information about the rate of that? But it has occurred multiple times in different groups. Um, there are some insects that are blind now, fish. I'm not sure if TF salamanders are blind or not. Right now. Oh, okay. So some are? Yeah. So I mean, that's a lot of examples already. So, yeah. So that could help you estimate. Well, you can get in trouble with these rate things if you have something that's not observed, right? So if I have, then I'm going to have zero, zero, uh, zero, one, 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 zero, right? And imagine I never observe one zero right, in nature. And that can happen. I can have two binary, two binary traits, just happen not to see that combination. But what's the best estimate of this rate? Zero. What's the best estimate of this rate? Zero. I get to do infinity, right? So if I get into this state, boom, I'm out of it right away. So you never catch me in this state. It'll be very quickly. Right? That's all the liquid I can go down. Can't get up very quickly. Okay. Um, how about this rate? Then, yeah. And this rate, zero. Right? And if you start doing averaging and you have infinities in there, it could be a problem. Right? And so. <coughs> So one fight we have in my lab right now is what to do in this case. And so one thing you could do is you can imagine that actually you can pop directly here, right? So you have that sort of instantaneous change, right? Does that make, it's probably something for some traits that are naturally coupled, but other traits probably not, right? Or you can just say, okay, let's just allow these to be estimated. Okay. Or is it a trunk of this from the model? And <coughs> one thing I've been doing is looking at sort of Rather than showing these as those fat versus thin arrows, showing the amount of time you spend in the states, then you might find that I spend you know, a little time in the state, a lot of time in the state, and some time in the state, and some time in the state, something like that. Um, rather than trying to show an infinitely fat arrow. Okay, so you can't get in trouble with that sort of thing. But for the case of, you know, where we've had five losses of eyes, that's probably enough data to get a good estimate rate. Okay. So, yeah. so why, I guess, if you lose the eyes, evolutionary times or you move back into a place where eyes have been needed, right? And then trying to get more years. I think that's the second way. So you could imagine, right, and so then the best estimate might be a rate of you know, a very, very tiny rate. Right? And then you could, you could fight to the death about whether it's exactly zero or not exactly zero. As I was saying, like, yeah, you know, that's a sort of trivial null. 
Um, then yeah, we know our eyes evolved at least once, so we know that it can't, it can't be exactly zero. Yeah. Um, actually, it was a famous ca case uh, maybe ten years ago at, with stick insects, and so stick insects you know, they actually have wings, most of them, they can fly. You know, these long, skinny, basically things. Um, but some of them don't have wings, and so they did re reconstruction on a tree and found it looked like some of them had lost wings as an ancestral state and regained them. Go. Oh, Revolution of a complex trait. Wow, and the, and the wing genes weren't being used, and they were used again. How did that happen? Um, there's a lot of discussion about what what this did. So I actually did a Bayesian analysis of that and found that we can support their idea even more strongly. So they did the parsimony analysis, um, and since then people have been attacking it because and I'm looking at like wings in males, but actually females still had, had wings. So it was like revolution of wings. We already had the genes working the other other gender. So not that hard. Um, that's a case where something was it actually an interesting question about can you re-evolve this complex trait? Whiting. Yeah. This is something can be very interesting. Okay. So <laughs> here I'm just having this you know, simple model and to make it even simpler. Um, and so I can say What's the probability <coughs> on you know, this branch R? Right? So probably the change from 0 to 1, or 0 to 0, or 1 to 1, or 1 to 0 on this. And take this here, right? You can find for the time of R, PR, right? And then calculate that. I could say if I had a zero here and a zero here, it's probably of that. Right? If it up, zero, zero. If I have a zero here and a one here, it's probably of that. Okay. <coughs> now how this changes the branch length. Right, so here I'm doing this plot of these varying TR. Okay. It's got a very small branch length. If I start at zero, right, I end at zero. So probably at zero, zero, one. If I start at zero, yeah, you probably would be one in no time at zero. Does that make sense what the curves are? Okay. Okay. Um, if we more time, you probably have changed it goes up. So now what I can do is, given you know this and this, I can figure out the probability of that. Let's get that. Okay, and I can now do that for the entire tree. So I could say, get that one. All right, so I could say, okay, it's probably going zero to zero given this tr, zero to zero given this tq. 0 to 1 given this 2q, 0 to 1 given this 2p, right, so forth. What does that give me? These all look good for. Okay, well, if I gave you this, and I said, was this zero here or one here? Would that help you? Would this at least help you? Okay. Mm -hmm. right, so I can use that, you know, probably going from zero to zero, kind of probably going from zero to zero, kind of probably going from zero to one. So from the entire tree, we can do the likelihood of this entire Probably would use data. We do the same thing here. Right? I do this probability. Um, so in this case, I'll do the same regardless. Right? Um, in general, it might not be the case. Can you compare that to So 
No one with a zero. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Right, so, okay. So, no, I mean, so what you're doing, so basically we observe this, this, and this, the one in beta. Um, and we're tra checking different inferences from these. And so, what you compare is the entire likelihood of the entire thing. We're doing a joint optimization, which we're thinking again to later. Yeah. So if it tells you that the probability of the one on the top is really low, then you have to get inside the one on the top. No, they're doing the whole tree at once. So it could be, for example, so on this one, maybe it's very unlikely to go from zero to one. Right? As long as it's non zero, maybe it's still the best, the best model. All right, so now I can actually use this to compare, you know, which of these constructions is better. Right. So using that very simple model we're talking about, I'll use for you know, Twinkies and everything else, and then I'll start making estimates of these ancestral states. Okay. Um, and so from that basic model, we got you know, hypotheses about race for a single character. Are they equal or not? Positive about correlation between characters, um, tree inference, which we'll get back to. You know, we, can, we can imagine comparing not just those paintings of the tree, but actually which tree is better by making different trees, right? And also ancestral states. Okay, so that's just that one model, because there's all this stuff. Now, this is one of the three models we'll talk about today. Let's take a break. We're getting tired. Um, run around and come back. So, meet again at 3.40 uh, or 3. Well, 337 by that point.